It's four o'clock in Radio Cairo, and this is World of Info. My name is Dr. Amr Mabrouk, and we are here with you in this pleasant afternoon in or Thursday in Cairo from uh, four till five. And today we have the great pleasure and honor to have with us Professor Hossam Mustafa Fahmi, Professor of Immunology at Ain Shams University, and at the same time the coordinator of the COVID-19 Task Force of the Ministry of Higher Education and Scientific Research. Thank you very much, Professor Hossam, for coming to us today in this beautiful afternoon in Cairo to talk about the one and only COVID-19. Thank you, Amr, an honor and pleasure to, have, to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So, uh, so it's, uh, it's something that is uh, a bit new. The, the fact that you have uh, you are now the coordinator of this uh, committee and it's been appointed by the Minister of, Ed, uh, of Higher Education, uh, Professor Khaled Abu Afar. Tell us about the, the task of this uh, committee and the, the different uh, views and access that you are working on through with it. Actually, it was uh, a new task for me as well. I was surprised when uh, Dr. Abu Afar uh, contacted me to uh, start this uh, committee. I thank him for uh, yeah, trusting me and I hope that I'll be uh, worth this uh, trust. Uh, actually, this um, committee has been uh, made to coordinate all scientific research related to all uh, research centers in Egypt, whether related to universities, national research center, uh, the medical corps, whether in the military uh, or in the uh, police uh, forces. We're trying to coordinate all such efforts and uh, give uh, the support needed, whether in uh, resources or putting uh, different uh, researchers together and um, allocating um, where you can find uh, different uh, research uh, facilities. So uh, the committee was um, when first uh, I was asked to recruit members we tried to cover all uh, Egyptian universities and the uh, medical corps to uh, have uh, not every single university, of course, but trying to represent uh, most of the uh, of the universities. And um, it's uh, interesting any scientific research related to anything uh, for the diagnosis or the treatment of um, COVID-19 in the epidemic or with the epidemiological studies related to the issue. So now it's been almost like one month uh, right uh, after the formation of this committee and you've had several meetings. So tell us about the different uh, perspectives that you are working on uh, in, uh, in this during short period of time and the hope in the future. Actually, it has been now for three months and we've made uh, more than uh, uh, one uh, meeting. At first, uh, the meetings were for people to uh, um, uh, discuss their thoughts and some brainstormings on the main um, access to follow in uh, research. Then we uh, invited all uh, interest candidates to propose uh, their uh, medical research uh, papers. They were thoroughly discussed by uh, experts in each field. And whenever there was something that was approved uh, by the committee, and before that it should have been approved by the ethical committee of the institute where the proposal comes from, then it is endorsed uh, officially and we try to uh, give all help and support to uh, such a proposal. We've got a uh, lots of proposal. Uh, not every one of them stood to the standards and the criteria we've put. So some were unfortunately rejected. Some there were some uh, notices on how to uh, adjust for the final uh, proposal to go on, and some were so good from the very beginning. So it represents uh, a normal uh, distribution of what you can get, and we're trying to uh, support anything that's genuine and uh, serious in uh, fighting the COVID-19. Uh, as we read in the newspapers and the multiple. Uh, uh, sources and media sources, we always know that uh, there are two paths for the treatment or for the management of such a huge uh, world crisis. One of them is uh, to get a, a good vaccine to vaccinate the people who were not affected by this virus and therefore uh, having a vaccine will stop the pandemic on the spot. And the second point is the treatment uh, 
policy and the different uh, drugs that have been tried uh, to be used in the market or in the in the field uh, with uh, trial and error. Could you please comment on these two paths and uh, from the scientific uh, perspective? Uh, you know, to develop a new uh, drug for uh, fighting uh, a well-known virus is something that um, requires a huge amount of money and uh, an enormous time. So uh, the whole world is now uh, walk, uh, working on what we can call drug repurposing. Drug repurposing means that there are uh, lots of drugs that we know that can either uh, act directly on other viruses or have some effects on viruses in the indirect way. And then we can try to use them to combat the coronavirus. Uh, we've got um, what we call the supercomputers, where you can enter the data of such uh, drugs and their chemical composition. And then uh, the computer would um, suggest you some uh, drugs better than others. And then you can go on uh, the, the trials. Unfortunately, even with such a step to bypass uh, developing a new drug, uh, drug this still uh, requires a lot of money and a lot of effort, but this is what the whole world now is uh, following. So this is one of the lines we're uh, following. Um, I cannot claim that there's a, uh, a drug that comes from Egypt that is um, really uh, genuine in having the properties to fight the COVID-19 uh, virus, but we've been evaluating some of the drops that came from uh, abroad. For example, the Minister of Higher Education, through his uh, connections and contacts, he got us um, samples of the Japanese drug, and it's working uh, uh, good uh, uh, till now. So this is what we can say about drugs till now. There's nothing that's 100% curative, but we're um, evaluating and some drugs are getting uh, good results. As for the vaccine, there's lots of um, misconceptions about the vaccines. Um, some people just would say, and uh, unfortunately I hear it from eminent uh, physicians, that you cannot have a vaccine for an RNA virus. Of course, this is not true. Uh, something like the rabies vaccines is, a, uh, is an RNA uh, vaccine. However, RNA uh, viruses, because of having just one um, uh, copy of the, the nucleotide strand, uh, during the multiplication, there could be some errors in the multiplication which leads to the mutations. So it's uh, more uh, prone to change the properties so that the vaccines will no longer be effective. However, the principle is already there. In the whole world, there are main three um, methods for making a vaccine. One of them is getting um, the virus inactivated, inactivated and it's retaining the physical and uh, chemical and immunological properties. And it's attached to an adjuvant, which maximizes the immune response of the body when the vaccine uh, containing the inactivated virus and adjuvant are injected. That's one uh, method, and that's the classical method that we uh, follow here in Egypt. And uh, this is what the Chinese are doing right now. Another methodology would be what we call the DNA vaccine, where with the recombinant DNA technology, you can uh, synthesize a part of the vaccine that is uh, more antigenic and then inject it into a person to get an immune response. And the third school would be um, a vector vaccine where you can get uh, parts of the vaccine or sorry of the virus that you want to uh, elicit an immune response and then you put it on a benign uh, virus and then inject it into a person it will multiplicate and also elicit immune response because of the antigenic part inserted on the benign virus of course it's the second and third uh, schools are um, very uh, costly and I'm not sure that they show much more efficiency than the first school, the classical school, which we're doing here in Egypt. I know quite well a trial that's going on in a very serious uh, setup. Uh, the Natural Research Center uh, also has some um, work related to these uh, vaccines. However, I haven't seen anything published yet. So. 
in conclusion, even for vaccines, we are doing um, some good, uh, pretty work. And I expect by uh, mid-August we can uh, announce the preclinical uh, studies that will lead to uh, hopefully a uh, clinical setup after that. The, uh, the problem with the, with the vaccine is that uh, it has sometimes like what's called a, a bad omen. And uh, we are through this uh, program, we want to, to, to simply uh, uh, give uh, the, the right message to the people. Some people say, if we are going to have this vaccine, uh, this might not protect us, or this could uh, be like an inoculation of uh, something serious, or this is a, a sort of a conspiracy theory, and all these uh, blah, blah, blah things that we are uh, reading in, the, in all the, the media uh, around us that really can uh, put the people on the edge. And some people are even putting a, a slogan, I'm not going to have the vaccine. So tell us about this uh, perspective, please. I've heard and read a lot about what you've mentioned. I'm not sure if there's any uh, rationale in what has been uh, said. I'm sure there's no scientific rationale whatsoever, but even why would someone go into such um, a pathway of thinking, I don't know. Um, we've heard very silly things that since uh, Bill Gates is the one who is endorsing the vaccine because of his involvement in charity work with um, infectious disease, then we would be having uh, microchips that are going to be injected in our bodies mm -hmm. to monitor us and all that uh, stuff. Uh, from the very beginning, there have been lots of uh, misconceptions about the virus, uh, starting that it has been uh, made through uh, warfare laboratories and that uh, you're not sure it had been leaked from China to the States or vice versa or whatsoever. What we see now, that's a pandemic that's affecting the whole world or the whole planet even. So, um, And when uh, someone said it's uh, made in the laboratory, Nature, which is a very prestigious uh, magazine, made uh, published an article that it's, uh, it's a virus of its own. There's no clue or no evidence that there's anything synthetic added to its uh, genome. And if you look uh, retrospectively in the last 10, 15 years, we've all witnessed the swine uh, flu, the avian flu, the SARS and the Mars. So it's more about the attitude of uh, mankind dealing with nature and the abnormal uh, uh, actions of eating wild animals or whatsoever. Uh, and uh, affect the natural habitats of uh, wild animals. So um, I'm not sure about the integrity of what you have mentioned on uh, people or anti-vaccines. Uh, I think if there's a good vaccine, and whether it's here in Egypt or in uh, any other uh, country that's uh, following the good standards of practice, nothing will be released unless it's sure that it's safe and efficient. We have just uh, we have just heard about the Oxford uh, vaccine uh, laboratory work, and there was a rumor that uh, that I just read today that uh, it's uh, progressing very rapidly. And even one of the scientists uh, on on board is an Egyptian gentleman, and he said that it's going to be very cost effective, almost approaching seven dollars per. Uh, Per, uh, per vial or per booster dose or whatever, and uh, he is very uh, optimistic. Do you share this optimism? Um, you're putting me in a very critical situation because the Egyptian gentleman keeps uh, announcing lots of announcements on Egyptian media, something that I'm not very comfortable with. I think with Jornun uh, and uh, serious scientific research, you wait till there's something published in a peer-reviewed uh, respectable magazine, then you can uh, make your own uh, statements. Um, I'm not sure about what he said because I'm not following uh, the gentleman, but I, I, I know that for a fact that it's almost finished with the preclinical studies and they're going on their way for the clinical studies with AstraZeneca. Uh, the problem is that there has been a um, reservation of the production till the end of the year for uh, Britain first and then its closest ally in the States and perhaps for other EU countries. 
Um, however, as we've, we've said earlier, this is one type of vaccine. The Chinese are working on another one, and there's another company, uh, Moderna in the States, that's working on a third vaccine. So you remain optimistic? Of course. Well, after this uh, beautiful statement about optimism, we'll have a break and we'll come back again with Professor Hossam Fahmi, Professor of Immunology in Shams University, and at the same time the coordinator of the COVID-19 Task Force of the Ministry of Higher Education and Scientific Research. Please stay with us. So we're back again with World of Info, and today our distinguished guest is Professor Hossam Fahmi, Professor of Immunology at Shams University, and the coordinator of the COVID-19 Task Force of the Ministry of Higher Education and Scientific Research. We're with you here until 5 p.m., and my name is Dr. Amr Mabrouk. So we are talking about COVID and how it really affect, affected the whole world. We have read before about the pandemics, we have read about the plague in the medieval period, and we have heard about the bouts of, uh, of uh, the typhus and of uh, even the influenza in 1919 and 1920, uh, acting as a pandemic, reaching the whole of Europe and killing more of the people than the people who were killed in World War I. And suddenly we are facing something of the unknown. We thought that pandemics are part of uh, history books, parts of uh, of uh, political scientists who like to give us uh, their own input and their own philosophy and now we faced uh, and now we faced something totally new uh, we have seen in the very early days of the COVID, president trump and with him a, a committee of scientists and supporters and physicians and an eminent gentleman who is above 70 and by the name of professor fauci so tell us about the whole, your whole perspective from the fact that you are a scientist and at the same time a cultural intellectual person who is looking a bit philosophical about what happened and your perspective of the world of 2020. Thank you for the nice compliment. However, um, I think it's a very uh, complicated situation and there has been failure on more than one level. Um, definitely the WHO was not very uh, good at dealing with uh, the situation in the very beginning. There was some denial that it could be a pandemic. Uh, let me remind you that President Pr Trump had fired the whole uh, infectious disease committee a few months before the COVID-19 epidemic, saying there's no u uh, need or no use of such uh, uh, committee. Uh, in the UK, the first statements of uh, the Prime Minister were uh, underestimating the, the severity of the pandemic. Uh, and you know, of course, with the ease of travel all over the world, there was just one small uh, epicenter in Wuhan in China that uh, led to the spread to the whole world. So it is a, a really a dire um, uh, situation. The whole world uh, got to its knees, although they, there were some uh, alarming signals, but nobody took it that seriously. Or even when this young uh, physician in China, in Wuhan, spoke about uh, uh, the disease very early, he was silenced until he died uh, as a victim of the virus itself. So I think that... Um, there are lots of lessons to learn from uh, what uh, happened um, all over the world in the great powers, in developed nations, developing nations, in uh, organizations like the WHO. Everybody needs to learn uh, a lesson from uh, what happened. As we just as I said uh, earlier in this episode, uh, we've witnessed more than one epidemic in the last 10 years. It seems that we are uh, destined to face more of them. We have to be more um, uh, ready to uh, how to deal with such an epidemic because it seems to be uh, even if not COVID nineteen, but there's a lot that we're going to face uh, to face in the near uh, future. When we raise the subject of the unpreparedness of the whole world, we found that certain countries have shown real uh, chaotic behavior. And uh, 
and uh, different policies. For example, Brazil, which is a very heavily populated country, claimed that there would be, should be no quarantine and that uh, people should not take care very much. And suddenly, Brazil and the whole Brazilians, a lot of them were victims, including the president himself, who was bragging about the effect of COVID. So uh, tell us about the Brazilian uh, experience from your point of view. And, of course, also another uh, country, which is Sweden, how they fared uh, in contrast to all the other Scandinavian uh, countries. The Scandinavian countries uh, did a lot of quarantine and uh, shut down while Sweden has allowed, has made a very partial, uh, almost symbolic uh, shutdown. Let's talk about Brazil as a start and Sweden as well. I think the problem with Brazil was simply denial, from the, even from the head of state. It's something like an ordinary influenza, will catch it, will go, go through it, and this turned into a real tragedy. Uh, we've all witnessed on uh, TV screens when the number of bodies needed to be buried are far more than the capabilities of the undertakers or the space available. So um, anyone who uh, thought that he could beat the virus with uh, denial or making a shortcut of just a few uh, uh, simple uh, measurements without taking it really seriously, it turned out in a catastrophic way. The same with uh, Sweden. Um, they, they assumed that for some reason they can continue having schools of children, uh, uh, school attendance for children and uh, having a normal social life. I think it also had a dramatic uh, unfavorable uh, ending. Let me remind you with the mask issue in the States. I mean, there was still denial of having uh, a mask or the effectivity of the mask. Um, I remember once... Uh, uh, CNN was making a, a live coverage on one of the very busy uh, beaches in uh, Florida. Everybody is enjoying his time, sitting very, very close. Now forget about the virus, forget about the mask. This is something that will pass through very easily. And uh, at a certain point, uh, Florida for a few uh, weeks was number one all over the nation in the number of uh, uh, new diagnosed patients every day. So. You, you, you mess with the virus, you get a very unfavorable end. end. Some people were claiming that there is something called herd immunity. And you are a professor of immunology. I think you are a sort of a reference to explain to us what is a real definition of a herd immunity and is there a possibility that the whole world will start having a herd immunity against this virus? Herd immunity is a very tricky um, term because, yes, in uh, if you're talking pure uh, science or in, in a theoretical way, if some, someone gets a sprinkle infection, he can get an, an, an immune uh, uh, status without getting uh, the disease. However, it's much more complicated than that, putting in mind more than one factor. For example, the demographics. In uh, Northern uh, Europe, in particular in the States, there's a big aging population. While here in Egypt, um, we can say that 60% uh, of uh, the population is less than 30 years. Of course, with the COVID-19, the general rule is that whenever you're more increased in age and there's a comorbidity, then there's a more uh, percentage or chance of getting a uh, severe form of disease and even a fatal uh, outcome. While in Egypt, with uh, a lot of the population below 30 years, then of course the fatalities are expected to be uh, less. So this is one element when comparing, cannot compare oranges to apples. The second is about the virus itself and its nature. Uh, we know now for a fact there's at least two or three strains worldwide uh, perhaps the immune uh, reaction to one is a little bit different than uh, the other. And uh, let me remind you that uh, there was a famous uh, incident in Egypt where there was a Taiwanese tourist who came uh, to Egypt and joined a Nile cruise. And uh, it was assumed at the beginning that she was the source of uh, COVID-19 infection to lots of the people on the cruise. However, when she went back to her country, 
and they got from her a sample and it was sequenced. Sequencing means uh, analyzing the genetic makeup of the, the virus which was found in her uh, sample. The CDC of Taiwan made an official statement that the strain found in the lady was quite different from that found on, in Taiwan, which means that she recruited the infection in Egypt from one probably of the tourists on the cruise and she propagated to others, but she was not the primary source from her country. So this is another um, element besides the nature of the virus that keeps changing. So herd immunity in theory is something good, but it's not as safe as remember when, when we were kids and then someone would get uh, a measles and then go to a measles party. Even this now is not very encouraged. However, it used to work. But for a herd immunity in COVID-19, this is extremely uh, risky, I think. We remember that the UK started uh, with, uh, with in the beginning, before understanding everything about the virus, they were claiming that there, at one time or another, they would have this herd immunity. And uh, Mr. Boris Johnson himself, the Prime Minister, already caught the virus and uh, he suffered uh, severely from the infection and even he was admitted to the ICU in spite of not being put on the ventilator. But uh, he was on a re or more or less an assisted respiration uh, method in order to help him to, to overcome this succumbing disease. So when we talk about, uh, about uh, the British experience, you think that there were some fallacies in it. Do you think so? Especially with the numbers? Uh, it's not only my opinion. It's, 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 it's already uh, mentioned in lots of uh, media that when uh, they were talking about uh, the numbers of, and the fatalities, the fatalities in the, in, in the, were only focused on those in hospitals, but people in uh, yes, nursing homes were not mentioned. So for, from the very beginning, there was some sort of manipulation in uh, the numbers. I think the response of the Prime Minister at the very beginning was extremely weak. Uh, putting in mind uh, also um, the recession in the past few years all over the world, it led even in uh, the developed countries like the UK or the, the States, there was a decrease in the budgets for the preventive medicine uh, measures which led to uh, having a big problem from the very start, besides uh, underestimating the, the seriousness of the disease and uh, the overconfidence. Since we are in the UK, then we have to cross to the mother continent, to Europe, and we have to speak about the Spanish, the French, and the Italian experience, which were very harsh experiences, especially for the Italians as a start, as a real epicenter in the industrial heart and uh, capitalist heart of Italy, in Milano and, and uh, surrounding regions. Tell us about your perspective about what happened in these three very highly advanced countries, rich countries, from different sources, whether they are from touristic or from uh, other uh, industries. Yet these are three of the richest countries of uh, of, uh, of Europe, and of course we have also to give a mention in the end to the experience of Germany. Let's start uh, with uh, Italy, and as you said, uh, ironically, uh, the problem was in the industrialized, developed north, not in the south, and uh, there are more than uh, one factor. But uh, according to a friend of mine, who was uh, very knowledgeable, he told me that uh, Milan is the capital of textile industry in uh, in um, Italy, and there are lots of Chinese visitors that used to visit uh, Milan, and that's one of the causes of the high uh, number of uh, initial uh, people diagnosed uh, in the north, and then of course they spread it uh, all over the place because it's uh, more industrialized and more um, economically uh, in better conditions. There's more of an aging population. So that led to the very uh, a huge number of uh, patients at the very beginning with the burden on the medical care uh, system. At the end, uh, the physicians, uh, the managing physicians uh, used to 
or had to play the role of God, uh, choosing who could uh, be on the ventilator to get a better chance to live and who has to leave the ventilator with uh, very low uh, possibilities of living. It was a very uh, bleak situation. But I think that for these European countries, they took it very, very seriously. So they managed to um, flatten the curve and then uh, reduce the numbers uh, substantially, much better than in uh, the UK and, of course, better than the States. However, even after the reduce in numbers, when there was a reopening, uh, whether without taking all the proper measures or um, reopening uh, with overexposure at the social uh, level. We've seen now a, a surge of new cases, at least in Catalonia, where 200,000 people are now back to uh, almost a complete quarantine like the older days. When we are speaking also, uh, we have to mention France and Germany. I think France more or less is the same as uh, Spain. It started with a huge uh, number that had a huge uh, burden on the medical system. But I think now they are, uh, they've made uh, a good job. Uh, Germany is Germany <laughs> from the very beginning. Uh, and let me uh, remind you, um, I, before speaking about Germany, I'll speak about South Korea. Because South Korea is a very uh, unique country. Uh, that it started as the second country after China or the most country with uh, cases outside of China. And it was like that for uh, quite a time. However, they were very, very aggressive in testing and in putting the rules for social distancing. When I say putting the rules, these were recommendations by the government but were not implemented by the law. There was no enforcement of law, but just recommendation. And because the people are very, very aware and very responsible, they just followed uh, the suggestions or the instructions without law enforcement. And this led uh, for Korea to be uh, to move from the second country after China now to something in the late 30s or the 40s, which is a very uh, respectable accomplishment. Uh, yes. I think uh, Germany more or less had the same uh, attitude. The people were very uh, serious in dealing with the uh, with the issue. So from the very beginning, um, the numbers were not comparable to those in other countries, and even the fatalities. And I think till now they're making uh, a good job. Mm -hmm. So we're still in the world of COVID, and we're still living in the, the world of COVID. Unfortunately. Uh, after six or seven months from uh, 2020. And we're still with Professor Hossam Fahmi, Professor of Immunology in Shams University, and the coordinator of COVID-19 Task Force of the Ministry of Higher Education and Scientific Research. Please stay with us after the break. Well, we are back here with the World of Info with Professor Hossam Fahmi, Professor of Immunology in Shams University, and the coordinator of the COVID-19 Task Force of the Ministry of Higher Education and Scientific Research. Well, Professor Hossam, we have just given a mention to some of the few countries in the world and their experience and their uh, dramatic experience with COVID, whether this was successful, very successful experience like the one in Korea, South Korea and in Germany and other with uh, prompt uh, procedures like in Germany, in France and Spain and, uh, and Italy and countries that uh, tried to, to correct their course like the UK. So we have to talk about the Indian experience and, of course, the African experience. And in the end, of course, we have to give a mention to the Chinese experience. Let's talk about India. It's a subcontinent. It's a huge country. It's the second uh, rating country in the number of population in comparison to China. And nothing can com be compared. I mean, 1, 1 billion plus 200 or 300 million. So it's competing with China for the first place of the most heavily populated uh, uh, countries in the world, a booming economy before the COVID, a uh, country with uh, atomic uh, power and atomic energy and atomic bombs, and yet they are now on the edge of the COVID. Is it the tip of iceberg or do you think that it will reach a climax and fade away? 
I think that currently India is in a very uh, critical uh, position. Let me remind you, in the very beginning, the numbers in, China, in India were very uh, limited and uh, because of the overpopulation and perhaps because of the lack of uh, discipline from normal citizens, it just exploded in the face of everyone and now the numbers are very, very, very uh, huge. Uh, and I don't expect it to be uh, uh, flattened in the near future. So when we're talking about Africa, I think there are two epicenters now in Africa. There's a huge number of uh, cases in South Africa and in Nigeria. Uh, I think these are the most countries with cases now, yeah. Uh, Australia and New Zealand, I think, had a, a good experience in the, as regards the shutdown and the quarantine, right? I totally agree with you. Uh, they were very serious from the beginning. Uh, there's no overpopulation problem. There's no problem with resources for testing. So I think, yes, they did a very good job, yeah. Now we are seeing a gush of cases in uh, countries very highly advanced, like the United States of America. And uh, do you think that uh, there is a light in the end of the tunnel for, for the United States, the number of cases would decrease in the beginning, in the, uh, in the end, or you still have this uh, high peak of rise? Um, for the states in particular, they've got an excellent, uh, brilliant man, Dr. Anthony Fauci, whose uh, last, last statement was, let's leave this uh, nonsense behind us and go uh, forward in our work and efforts. As long as there's denial on simple things like uh, the importance of testing, uh, wearing a mask, on uh, social distancing and the early opening of businesses, I think it's going to be here for some time. Um, let me tell you that some of the universities now in the States have already announced that their f the coming semester in the fall is going to be online, which means that even for such educational institutes, they are not very uh, optimistic about the near future. Uh, this will leave us with uh, our country, Egypt. Uh, Dr. Khal Awafar, the Minister of Higher Education and Scientific Research, had a speech almost one month ago in front of President Sisi and he predicted that things are going to get better and that the number of patients will decrease. A lot of people on that day uh, were very skeptical of uh, his statement and said uh, he's over optimistic and uh, we don't think that the number of patients will decrease in Egypt but they would be rising. And yes, we found a surge of patients and then suddenly or luckily uh, the number is decreasing, whether this is mortality or uh, on the number of patients that are tested positive. And at the same time, uh, if people are denying this statistics of the government, we see that hospitals or isolation hospitals are shutting down for uh, lack of patients. Tell us about this perspective, about this statement and uh, the, the, the hope in the future. Well, Dr. Held is a uh, Minister of Scientific Research and he's a scientific person with a scientific mind. So he followed uh, the correct way of making the prediction curves by g giving uh, the input of uh, the cases we have and the population demographics. And then he was very uh, successful in predicting round figures of uh, the increase in the curve, the flattening and hopefully the decrease. However, when you come now to the decrease in the curve, which we are witnessing and we are sure of, we have to be very cautious, extremely cautious, because this does not negate the fact that we still have to stick to the basic rules of uh, social distancing and wearing the mask. The worst thing to do now is to uh, think that uh, the COVID-19 problem is behind our backs and start to resume our uh, normal life activities. This is the worst thing to do in uh, this situation. We've been, um, I, I can say it very proudly that Egypt was one of the very uh, serious countries from the beginning in dealing with the issue. We closed our borders um, uh, very early, relatively, uh, by the third week of uh, March. 
and we tried our best within our uh, resources and keeping a fine line between maintaining the economy and making the basic measures to to uh, fight COVID-19. I think we did a, uh, a good job to a big uh, extent. So uh, I think the message that has to be very clear to all of us is too early to uh, put the COVID-19 problem behind our back. We should maintain our social distancing policies, uh, the mask wearing policies, and trying to avoid any unnecessary outdoor activities till we till uh, we, we actually uh, reach the proper uh, step of being uh, safe and secure. Well, we have to raise this point from the scientific perspective as well, which is the second wave and the third wave. All these probabilities and the things that are making everybody afraid that we'll face a second or a third wave. How far is this pessimistic point of view right from the scientific perspective? These are just mere predictions. They can and may not happen. There are lots of factors. Uh, it's like uh, having any residual infections that can explode after that. Uh, if we're not keeping a good eye on our uh, borders, uh, let me remind you about uh, the example of the state of Israel. Israel was one of the very uh, successful uh, countries in the beginning with uh, dealing with uh, the COVID-19 uh, problem. However, with uh, over early uh, resuming of activities, of uh, the normal activities, Israel now is in a very serious uh, problem with what you can call a second wave of infections. So I think the predicting a second or third wave is something theoretical that can happen or not happen depends on how each country is, depend is dealing with uh, its uh, patient and its borders. So, uh, in the end, before we leave, I think we have uh, to give our uh, listeners uh, short of a summary or resume. Mm -hmm. What should we do? What should we always put in mind? And how far should we resume our normal activities? And uh, what restrictions we should make? I think uh, there's a statement that we've all heard, and it's very true. Um, the world before COVID-19 is not no longer the world after COVID-19. We have to change a lot. We have to change our social habits of uh, hugging or uh, getting close contact when greeting people. I think we should uh, maintain our social distance at least for the time uh, being, wearing uh, masks, avoiding um, activities indoors or in closed uh, areas. I'm not sure how the world will uh, emerge after this epidemic, like in, but I'm sure that there are going to be uh, changes in the way we travel, the way we uh, uh, sit in the airports or whatsoever. Uh, so there are things we should uh, stick to and do it uh, by ourselves, as I said, with, uh, when uh, encountering people or with our activities. And there's some things that we uh, are going to wait to uh, see how they'll emerge. For example, for in the field of education, uh, it seems that from now on, uh, online education will be an integral part of the educational process, not only a luxury as it used to be in the past. Well, I think there is a lot of food of thought in our uh, talk in this beautiful afternoon in Cairo with Professor Hossam Fahmi, Professor of Immunology in Shams University and the coordinator of the COVID-19 Task Force of the Ministry of Higher Education and Scientific Research. Dr. Hossam, really thank you very much and we appreciate your time and efforts and we are wishing you the best of luck in your uh, duty as a coordinator of the COVID-19 uh, Task Force, hoping that next time when we meet we are going to bring more uh, joyful uh, news for our listeners and uh, more happy news about the number of patients reduction in the country of Egypt. Sir, thank you very much and looking forward to see you again. This was World of Info. My name is Dr. Amr Mabrouk. Hopefully that we're going to see you at the same time, the same station, exactly one week from today. Thank you.